The West blames jihadist radicals, the Kremlin searching for a Ukraine connection, and Russia is reeling. Moscow's deadliest terror attack in nearly two decades follows the same modus operandi as the 2015 Bataclan concert hall massacre here in Paris. We'll ask about Friday night's bloodbath, why Moscow was targeted, the four alleged gunmen uh, among uh, more than a dozen currently in custody, and the claim of responsibility by the Central Asia-based militants of ISIS Khorasan. As countries like France raise their terror alert levels, we'll ask about Vladimir Putin's next move. How caught off guard was he? And how will the Russian president respond to the grief and the outcry? Today in the France 24 uh, debate, we're looking at Friday's uh, massacre. With us, exiled investigative Russian journalist Anastasia Kirilenko. Thanks for being with us. Hello. Uh, from Los Angeles, Colin Clark, senior research fellow at Security and Conflict Resolution think tank, the Sufan Center. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. And from Washington, Edward Lemon, researcher and assistant professor at, uh, the, of international affairs at Texas A&M University's Bush School of Government and Public Service. Welcome to the France 24 debate. Thank you for having me. Your reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. 137 killed, dozens more injured. Russia reeling from Friday's attack at the Crocus City Concert Hall. These were uh, scenes earlier in the day uh, people bringing uh, flowers once again this Monday uh, to the outskirts of Moscow, uh, where the attacks ha where the attack happened. I was here on the 22nd. Miraculously, I managed to leave. We were sitting in the parterre, and I also experienced this with my husband. We want to honor the memory of those who stayed here forever. Anastasia Kirilenko, it, it really does feel like the Bataclan in a way. Yes, of course, uh, me also. I've been to this uh, Crocus City Hall uh, 10 years ago. Uh, fortunately, my family is safe, everybody is safe, but of, of course I, I, I'm shocked. Uh, but uh, now the debate in, in Russia is, is how the authorities will, will try to take profit uh, for their propaganda. Yeah, and that's something that Vladimir Putin has been saying in the last minutes. Um, he says uh, uh, he's been speaking uh, live, saying it was an act of intimidation. We know who committed the crime. Now we want to know who ordered it. Uh, Putin uh, adding, uh, we're interested in uh, uh, who is who this benefits and saying as well that, uh, again, trying to make that uh, a Kiev connection, saying that uh, it's also part of uh, the uh, Ukraine Kiev regime, these are his words, attacks uh, on Russia. There's nothing to substantiate that. Earlier, the four gunmen appearing in court after visible signs of being roughed up, uh, all of them uh, nationals of uh, Tajikistan. Uh, Eliza Herbert has more. Less than 48 hours after the Crocus City Hall attack, four suspects appeared before the Russian courts. They're believed to be the gunmen who carried out the attack. Facing charges of terrorism, they could receive life imprisonment and will be remanded in custody as a pre-trial restriction. Two of the suspects were stopped at the wheel of this car after a chase on Friday night. The other two were later detained. Meanwhile, at the scene of the attack, the investigation is ongoing. Russian officials say they found an automatic weapon, vests with spare magazines and bullet casings. Investigations are underway with the suspects in the terrorist attack. The bodies are still being identified. At present, the bodies of 137 people, including three children, have been found at the site. So far, 62 have been identified. The assailants are also alleged to have detonated explosives, causing the fire that has complicated work for the investigative team. In a televised address, President Vladimir Putin said that 11 people had been arrested, including the four gunmen who have been identified as citizens of Tajikistan. Amid the allegations, Putin spoke on the phone with the leader of Tajikistan and discussed the fight against terrorism. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for the attack and with more than 130 victims, it is the deadliest day of terror in Russia in decades. 
Colin Clark, uh, the uh, um, Turkish authorities in the last hours uh, saying that uh, the gunmen had traveled there uh, to renew their Russian residency at the start of the month. When you think back to last Friday, the United States had warned uh, its citizens more than 10 days ago uh, that there was the possibility of a, of a terror attack. How does intelligence gathering work in these circumstances? Well, we'll never know because uh, the Russians are highly unlikely to speak about the specific details. They whiffed on this. Uh, the United States passed this intelligence. They either dismissed it outright uh, because U.S.-Russian relations are at somewhat of an adir, or their security services, which are, you know, arguably overstretched given Ukraine, uh, were unable to disrupt the plot. Either way, they missed it. And now you see embarrassment, you see some anger, and you see a lot of deflection and obfuscation pointing the finger at Ukraine. Pointing the finger at Ukraine, and for the first time, though, in those remarks, Colin, uh, the Russian president saying Isl Islamist terrorists uh, were responsible. Look, this is a replay of what happened in early January in Iran. The United States warned the Iranians of a pending attack. You had the Kerman attack, uh, which was also Islamic State Khorasan, and then you had the Iranians coming out blaming the Israelis at first then backtracking once they had to dismantle. Look, at the end of the day, they still have to deal with the real issue, despite all the propaganda. So they unravel the network and then they kind of, you know, meld the two. So in popular, uh, you know, imagination, it's very unclear who was what. But failures, intelligence failures, both first with Iran, now with Russia, and of course, the usual kind of finger pointing and trying to uh, escape blame for what was clearly an intelligence failure. Uh, Edward Lemon, uh, more than a dozen have been arrested uh, now, and among them, the four suspected gunmen, all of them nationals of Tajikistan. Why Tajikistan? Well, Tajikistan uh, is the poorest country in the broader region. It's the most migration-dependent country in the world. According to World Bank statistics from last year, half of its economy is based on migration. And so there are a large number of Tajik migrants in Russia, over 1.3 million, according to official statistics, probably more like 2 million. And they live very difficult uh, and marginalized lives in in Russia. Traditionally, um, Tajiks have been very key to global jihadist networks. Um, it was the third on a per capita basis highest exporter of foreign fighters to the conflict in Syria and Iraq. And Tajiks have been involved in various international attacks, uh, the one that Colin mentioned in Kerman in Iran earlier this year, attacks in Afghanistan and foil plots in Germany and Austria. So um, combination of the presence of large numbers of Tajiks in uh, Russia coupled with their role of a small minority in uh, global jihadist networks. Yeah, we, 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 want, we wonder, what is ISIS-K? ISIS-K is, is an organization that is an offshoot of the main ISIS group that formed in Afghanistan in 2014 with the goal of establishing um, a branch and a, a part of the caliphate in uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India and the rest of Central Asia. And it's thus far, its operations have concentrated primarily in Afghanistan, but it's also had operations beyond its borders, various attempts and foil plots within Russia itself. Yeah, earlier at the United Nations Security Council, we had a minute of silence observed uh, for the victims of uh, Friday's attack. And while the White House rules out an imminent threat from ISIS on U.S. soil, France raising its terror alert level the French President Emmanuel Macron on a trip to uh, French Guiana, offering Russia assistance in taking on jihadist networks, all the while warning the Kremlin not to instrumentalize the attack uh, by uh, blaming uh, Ukraine. Uh, this offer of help, your, your reaction to that, Anastasia? Uh, Macron uh, has to take into account that Russia is not a, a democratic state. And, uh, of course, the cont context of Ukrainian war, uh, this morning Russia sent missiles on, on Kyiv uh, with subscriptions for Krokus. So I'm, I'm happy that now uh, Putin recognizes uh, there is an is Islamic uh, state responsibility, but it, it happened uh, only 
uh, a bit too late. They already blamed uh, Ukraine, I mean uh, Putin himself, in state pro propaganda media. So how in this context uh, Russia uh, and France can really cooperate? By the way... But well, let me just ask you, because it's, it's difficult to get your head around that. Uh, it's in France's self-interest to take on these cross-border organizations as have been described by, there by, by, by Colin and Edward. Uh, I can see the interest of uh, Macron. Uh, this is, uh, you know, the political competition and to, uh, to disarm the far right uh, somehow. He, uh, he raises the voice uh, saying we are uh, combating terrorism, including if needed, we will cooperate with Russia. But then uh, practically, uh, will it really happen? Uh, you know, we can have questions and also how will it work and the other way around. What Russia may uh, uh, communicate to, to France about possibly radicalized North Caucasus uh, uh, originally people who are on French soil. Uh, yeah, the, Colin Clark, how does that work? Uh, are, are these people in their little vacuum, in their little bubble, the ones who, who work on jihadists, and therefore, they do they cooperate or not? Look, there's, uh, you know, ISIS is a global network of affiliates, franchise groups, uh, you know, and branches, essentially. Uh, and so I think in the coming days and weeks, we're likely to learn more about the perpetrators and if they had connections to the broader kind of, uh, you know, jihadist diaspora in Central Asia, right? If you think about Islamic State in the Caucasus, um, I, I did a Twitter thread this morning on what the threat looked like seven years ago because there were attacks uh, in Russia in 2017. Uh, and it was just kind of at, at the time, well, there's a jihadist problem. You have the Caucasus, you also have Central Asia, and you've got connections and networks that span these two. It's not as cut and dried as I'm a card ca carrying member of ISIS K. In some case it is, but there's a broader kind of logistical or support function uh, in some of these cases, which allows attackers to get their hands on weapons, explosives, vehicles, et cetera. The fact that it was very quickly up on uh, ISIS K's propaganda channels, what does that tell you? Uh, tells you that it was well planned. They were anticipating this. Uh, you know, the, the attack happened on a Friday. On Tuesday, I'd actually tweeted out ISIS K knocking on the door in Europe uh, because of this steady drumbeat of plots that had been disrupted. Uh, when you see a growing intent married to uh, a, a fairly you know sophisticated capability, that's where you have real problems here. ISIS also has really good intelligence and likely perceived vulnerability in the Russian security services, again, who are concentrated, one, on Ukraine, uh, and in the last couple of weeks, they've been concentrated on uh, individuals that were pro-Navalny supporters after his death, and then anybody that may have been attempting to disrupt Russian elections. So they hadn't been doing their job of internal security and looking at counterterrorism within Russia proper. Uh, Edward Lemon, why target Russia for this spectacularly? After all, uh, Russia, which has come out in uh, favor of, uh, uh, of Gaza, welcoming a Hamas delegation even to Moscow. Well, I think if we look, um, and Colin and others and myself have tracked ISKP's um, messaging over the years through their official channels and through various other channels, and they've had a consistent criticism of Russia. And I think they blame Russia in, in many ways for the demise of the group and its presence in Syria. Of course, Russia started its bombing campaign in 2015 against against in, in support of Assad, against um, ISIS, amongst other groups in um, in Syria. And so they blame both the West and Russia for, for the demise of the group. And I think coupled with that, they have a large, um, there's a large group of potential supporters uh, amongst uh, Muslim populations of Russia and amongst Central Asian migrant populations of Russia that the group has been trying to reach out to. So I think it's a combination of, of those factors. Combination of those factors. And if we're going to take the long view, you have to go back to September 1999. It was one month after Vladimir Putin was plucked from obscurity and became Boris Yeltsin's prime minister. Several cities, including Moscow, rocked by a wave of apartment building bombings. Uh, the, that was the trigger for the Second Chechen War, which would propel Putin's popularity as a strong man. He famously vowed to pursue the perpetrators and, quote, whack them in the outhouse. That's a kind translation. I think the words were a little bit stronger. Uh, a year later, Vladimir Putin was president and the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, Anastasia Kirilenko, 
There's always been this suspicion, these questions of whether or not those 1999 wave of bombings was perhaps, were there people manipulated? Was it instrumentalized at the time? Today, though, it seems like a completely different case. Uh, not completely. By the way, about these 1990 uh, terror attacks, there are even books in the US. Uh, there is a journalist who is doing Freedom of Information Act. Uh, uh, based on, on that, he's trying to investigate uh, were the security services of Russia behind or not. And, and now, yeah, from... Because every time there's been a terror attack, it's benefited Vladimir Putin. It benefited, and the worst, uh, this is the so-called Razan training. So once uh, in 2000, the local residents of Razan, a town in Russia, the, uh, they, uh, the, uh, they, uh, they saw uh, suspects uh, uh, which were bombing the basement of a residential building. And two days later, uh, the FSB sh uh, should comment, you know, it was a training. What training? So th this training uh, remains uh, uh, something Okay, but that was then. That was yeah, 1999. Today, though, it's different, right? Today, from the one hand, it is different. From the uh, other hand, uh, theoretically, uh, the security services of, of Russia could uh, be prevented about this terror attack and, and not to react. What, by the way, really happened, uh, the U.S. said, you know, there is a, a terror attack in preparation, and uh, Russia laughed. Uh, the propaganda laughed, uh, saying they tried to intimidate us, uh, nothing will happen. So, so the question uh, remains, of course, why uh, uh, did not they react? Probably they calculated that anyway, politically, they control everything, media, and they will benefit anyway. Because even if the terror attack happens, Putin presents himself as a strong leader. Uh, so now Russians uh, so-called uh, so need him even more to combat terrorism. He's in charge of Russia since uh, 25 years now. He still uh, d uh, did not win uh, against the terrorism, but, uh, you know, for in the state... Uh, in which so in the short term, he'll benefit, is uh, what you're saying? Uh, he will benefit, of course, uh, blaming uh, everyone, uh, even Ukraine, even the West, even Europe uh, behind. Uh, I'm telling about the propaganda narratives uh, right now. Yeah, so just because there are these precedents, again, I'll put it to you, Colin Clark, uh, does that mean that the, the events play in Putin's favor this time? No, I don't think they do, but he's kind of been a master at turning these events on its head. And, uh, you know, he, he's an opportunist, and he's going to use this to rally support, uh, potentially conscript more Russians into service to fight in this disastrous war in Ukraine. Um, but at the end of the day... His security service is still missed a growing threat. The threat may not be over. Uh, and so I think there's going to be some soul searching, you know, at least in private among top Russian officials about what do they do about this threat, particularly if it's emanating from Afghanistan, where right now, you know, the Taliban's in charge of counterterrorism. So I think, you know, that's a major blind spot for countries in the region. Uh, it's a huge problem, and it's one that's getting worse, not better. The Taliban who've been targeted by ISIS-K. Right. So it's not a matter of, uh, you know, uh, intent. The Taliban very much wants to combat ISIS-K. It's a matter of capability. Uh, they're stronger than ISIS-K, but not strong enough to completely attenuate the group and destroy it. So in Nangarhar province and, and other areas along the border with Pakistan, uh, this is a group that's remained stubbornly persistent. Uh, and clearly its tentacles and its network stretch outside of Afghanistan throughout the broader region. Edward Lemon, for the past two years, it's been an uneasy uh, partnership between the former Soviet states that are not Ukraine uh, and, and Moscow. Uh, when there's that phone call between Tajikistan uh, and, and, and the Tajik president and the Russian president earlier uh, in the day, it's a balancing act.
It is indeed, and, and Tajikistan has been one of the few remaining allies of Russia in the region. In fact, Vladimir Putin's first trip after the full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022 was to Tajikistan, and the two countries have a, a have a close relationship. Russia has a base in Tajikistan. Tajikistan is reliant on Russia for its migrant population, but so is Russia. And so I think that in that conversation, uh, the president of Tajikistan, Rahman, said that terrorism doesn't have a country. And he's very much trying now to manage the potential crises, crisis in this relationship that is, I think, of importance to both sides. And I think uh, Vladimir Putin will have this in mind when he's passing out the blame. And it does seem he's targeting Ukraine and the West more so than blaming Tajikistan or the Tajik people for this. But of course, the population is already reacting um, and blaming the Tajik people. And there have been a lot of uh, xenophobic acts that have happened in the days after the event against Tajik migrants. And more broadly, how will this play in the rest of Central Asia? Well, I think for there's a common interest in the region and between Russia and Central Asia in combating terrorism and extremism, and there's been a common politicization of this issue. I think there's continued concern that there'll be similar attacks in the region, and we've seen a string of, of plots and others being foiled. So I think there'll be continued focus on this issue and continued utilization of it to consolidate the authoritarian rule, which continues to be the pattern that we see. And as you were saying earlier, Anastasia Kirilenko, while all this is happening, there were fresh strikes on Ukraine's capital this Monday. Mm, yes, exactly. So uh, they uh, hit uh, Ukraine with some missiles uh, where it was clearly written it is a revenge for the terror attack on, on Krokus City Hall. The propaganda was amplifying this, uh, this claim. Uh, but the worst thing also this uh, propaganda, I mean, um, RT, other media which still exist, uh, which still exist on social media, they claim that ISIS was created by, um, by the US and the West in general. Now we can laugh, but you know, uh, it's growing. Uh, people who believe in, in it, uh, it's growing. Sometimes uh, uh, these cons conspiracy theories uh, receive uh, millions uh, of shares. Conspiracy theories in overdrive, that's a difference between 2015 and the last time we had the big wave of terror attacks, Colin Clark? Yeah, and I'd say, you know, I, I hope we don't get back to that point. I don't think we will. You know, the apex of the caliphate 2015, 2016, where it seemed like every time we turned around, there was an attack, a vehicle attack or a stabbing in France. The operational tempo was among the most significant since I've been studying terrorism. I don't think we're headed back there. Uh, but given all of the other kind of distractions uh, that states face, this concept of great power competition, I think it is a major vulnerability. Um, and I'm concerned about things like the Paris 2024 Summer Olympics, which are a really attractive target for uh, a number of terrorist groups, not just ISIS. What the government is saying here so far is that the problem could be um, smaller isolated incidents, not so much uh, the big spectacular attack like the one we saw last Friday, Colin. Or it could be both. Uh, we could see a number of kind of lone actor style attacks. Um, you know, and look, it's not just jihadi terrorism. We could see things from the far right. Uh, when you have an event of that magnitude, it brings everybody out of the woodwork. Uh, and France, very sadly, uh, has often been the target of, of terrorism, you know, over the past uh, 10 years in particular, but, but going back further afield. Um, and I think, you know, there's also concern about uh, former jihadis that have been jailed that are now kind of coming out of prison. Their, their prison sentences are ending. Um, and it also further stretches the bandwidth of the security services that now have to monitor this larger group of people. One final question. I'll put it to you, Anastasia Kirilenko. We were just looking at those images of uh, uh, outside the Crocus uh, Hall. And uh, since those are from earlier in the day. This evening, the, the, yeah. the amount of flowers is huge. I mean, this is such a big event for... for yes. For, of course, it's a big event. Uh, it's the capital. Um, some victims uh, were not originally from Moscow, and now the government uh, says, uh, says uh, it will pay uh, the trips uh, from Ural to, for relatives of the victims. What is also tremendous for me, Russian population uh, does not embrace 100% the, the official version. The, also, the cost of life is really low in Russia, and this is another shock um, because this, uh, you know, medical care 
came uh, one hour and a half after the, the terror attack started. And so for ordinary Russians, it's the first shock, not even ISIS or, or whatever. But not, not being protected by the state. Our thoughts, in any case, uh, go out uh, to the victims and their families. I want to thank you so much, Anastasia Kirilenko, for being with us. Colin Clark in Los Angeles, Edward Lemon in Washington. Thank you for joining us here for this edition of the France 24 debate. The creation